Thank you so much. Thank you. It's great to be here in Burlington. Thank you for coming out and spending the morning with us. You know, I've got to tell you, someone had said, you know, what's the hardest thing about running for president? And I said, it's cold. It's like really cold. And Iowa's cold and New Hampshire's cold. And this southern girl is not used to this kind of cold. And what cracks me up is y'all turn around and say, oh, this is mild. No, it's not. This is not mild. And your 50-something degrees, that's not what our 50-something degrees feels like in South Carolina. But we are grinning and bearing it um, and continuing to put on more and more layers. So thank you for taking the time to come out. I want to thank Megan and Logan. They're here. I think they're back in the back. Give them a round of applause. This is a beautiful spot. This is a great spot to have in your community. And, you know, I've always said small businesses are the heartbeat of our economy. And so we always have to take care of them. So thank you for all you do for the community. You know, I was, how many of you are hearing me for the first time at a town hall? Well, where have y'all been? <laughs> Welcome. Okay, good. I was born and raised in a small rural town in South Carolina. Two stoplights, 2,500 people. You couldn't think about doing something wrong without somebody already telling your mom. I grew up playing on a cotton field and at a dairy farm. And my mom started a business out of the living room of our home. 30-plus years later, it was a successful business. I started doing the books for the family business when I was 13. It wasn't until I got to college that I realized that was child labor. I'm not an Ivy Leaguer. I went to a public university. I went to Clemson University, go Tigers. Graduated with a degree in accounting. Accountants are problem solvers. I think we could use an accountant in the White House these days. And then I went on and worked in the corporate world for a while. And I came back home to the family business. And one day I happened to be sitting with my mom, telling her how hard it was to make a dollar and how easy it was for government to take it. And my mom said, quit complaining about it, do something about it. I truly did not know you weren't supposed to run against a 30-year incumbent in a primary. I had never been politically active. Once I realized he was related to half the district, the only option was to win. So I went around the district and said, we have way too many lawyers at the state house. I think they need a really good accountant. And the district took a chance on me, and we won. When I got to the state house, my big fights were always to help small businesses. I grew up in a small business. I knew what small businesses meant to the economy. And so that was my focus for three or four years. But in South Carolina, legislation was typically passed by a voice vote. All in favor, say aye. All opposed, nay. The ayes have it. But one day they passed through a bill that would give legislators a pay raise. All in favor, say aye. All opposed, silence. The ayes have it. Yet to this day, you can't find a legislator that says they voted themselves a pay raise. I was furious because we had a Republican House, a Republican Senate, and a Republican governor. So I filed a bill that said anything important enough to be debated on the floor of the House or the Senate is important enough for the people to know how their legislators voted. And the Speaker of the House said, put the bill away. We don't need to have it. We will decide what the public needs to see and what they don't. Long story short, when I refused to put the bill away, when I went around the state of South Carolina telling them about the importance of what was happening, they stripped me of everything. I lost all my seniority. They took me off my committees. I could take the well. No one would hear me speak. I could sponsor a bill. No one would co-sponsor. So I ran for governor. I was the Tea Party can candidate when I ran for governor, and I am proud to say one of the first bills we signed into law is now in South Carolina. Anything important enough to be debated on the floor of the House or the Senate requires a legislative vote on the record, and we took it a step further, and we did it on every section of the budget. And I love music, and you were listening to my playlist, and so on the day of the bill signing, we blasted throughout the State House. Pat Benatar's hit me with your best shot. When I became governor, South Carolina was hurting. We had 11% unemployment. We had thousands of people on welfare. And South Carolina was the butt of the jokes. And we got to work. 
By the time I left, we were building planes with Boeing. We were building more BMWs than any place in the world. We brought in Mercedes-Benz. We brought in Volvo, five international tire companies, and they were referring to South Carolina as the beast of the southeast, which I love. We announced jobs in every county in the state. We moved that 11 percent unemployment down to 4 percent. But we also acknowledged some truths. We said, if you have to show picture ID to buy Sudafed, if you have to show picture ID to get on a plane, you should have to show picture ID to protect the integrity of the election process. <clears throat> we passed voter ID in South Carolina. We passed one of the toughest illegal immigration laws in the country. We passed tort reform. We, pay we did pension reform. We paid down our debts. We built up our coffers. We cut taxes. And by the time we left, South Carolina was named the friendliest state in the country, the most patriotic state in the country, and the number two state in the country people were moving to. And then I got the call for the United Nations. And my honest answer was, I don't even know what the UN does. I just know everybody hates it. And I wasn't wrong about that. But when I got to the UN, I wanted countries to know what America was for and what America was against. I didn't care if they didn't like me, but I wanted them to respect America. And we got to work. We pulled ourselves out of the Iran deal. We moved the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. We pushed China and passed the largest set of sanctions against a country in a generation against North Korea and got them to stop testing ballistic missiles. We got ourselves out of the Human Rights Council. We made sure that we cut a billion dollars off the top the very first year. We made sure that we pulled out of the Paris Climate Agreement. We stopped giving any taxpayer money, American taxpayer money, to the Palestinian Refugee Organization. But the best thing that we did was we took the kick me sign off of our backs, and America was respected again at the UN. Now I'm running for president, and I don't need to tell you how bad things are. You don't have to turn on the news to see it. You look at, you feel it when you go to the grocery store. You feel it when you go to the gas station. You feel it in your mortgage payment, in your insurance payment. Everything that we have to pay, it's all gone up. And I would love to tell you that Biden did that to us. And he sent us down the socialism creep that's dangerous, that we have to stop. But I have always spoken in hard truths, and I'm going to do that with you this morning. Our Republicans did that to us, too. You go back and look at that $2.2 trillion COVID stimulus bill that they passed with no accountability whatsoever. It expanded welfare that has now given us 100 million Americans on Medicaid, 42 million Americans on food stamps. That's a third of our country. And did Republicans try and make it right? Nope. They doubled down and opened up earmarks and pet projects for the first time in 10 years, pushing through 7,000 of them last December. Want to know how they spent your money? $30 million on an honors college in Vermont. $10 million to tear down a hotel in Alaska. $7.5 million on a courthouse in Colorado. And the list goes on. In the 2024 appropriations budget, Republicans put in $7.4 billion worth of pet projects and earmarks. Democrats put in $2.8 billion. Now you tell me who the big spenders are. All while one in six American families can't pay their utility bill, 60% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck, 50% of American families can't afford diapers, homelessness has gone up 12%. We have over 653,000 Americans who are homeless. Social Security will go bankrupt in 10 years. Medicare will go bankrupt in eight. Then you look at our education system. Everybody wants to blame COVID for education. We had problems with education before COVID. Do you know right now in America, only 31% of eighth graders are proficient in reading? 31%. Only 27% of eighth graders are proficient in math. If we don't do something quick, 
We're going to be in a world of hurt 10 years from now. And then you look at the situation on the border. And I want to tell you, first of all, you have a fighter in Marionette Miller Meeks. You really do. Y'all are blessed to have her represent you. But to see what we're having to fight to secure that border is unthinkable. The fact that Biden and the Democrats refuse to secure it truly is a dereliction of duty. I've been to the border, and I didn't go pull a Kamala and come back. I went 400 miles down that border. You're not ready for what I saw. Mounds of shoes, mounds of clothes, paraphernalia, rape areas that the women and girls have to walk through. When you get up in the morning, you get your coffee and you watch the news. When these ranchers get up in the morning, they get their coffee and they go see if anyone died crossing the fence. They pick up whatever little kids were left behind and turn them over to Border Patrol. I met with multiple sheriffs. They said before 7 a.m. they round up whatever illegal immigrants they can find. They turn them over to Border Patrol. Border Patrol documents them and releases them until their court date years from now. And when I asked Border Patrol about their job, they said, you want to know what we do? We're glorified babysitters. They don't let us do our job. Eight million illegal immigrants have come to that border. We had enough fentanyl cross the border last year that would kill every single American. Number one cause of death for adults 18 to 45, fentanyl. And don't think for a second China doesn't know what they're doing when they send it over. And then my parents always taught me, you take care of those who take care of you. I'm going to ask you if we're taking care of those who take care of us. Right now in America, over 35,000 veterans are homeless. One in three suffers from PTSD or thoughts of suicide. We lose 22 heroes a day to suicide. If a veteran needs a doctor's appointment, on average, takes them 29 days. Why 29 days? Because on the 30th day, they can go to the doctor or hospital of their choice. So midway through the 29 days, they get a call to reschedule, and the clock starts all over again. It's shameful how we treat our veterans. And then you look at D.C., and you're saying, what have they done for us, right? Don't you think it's finally time we had term limits in Washington, D.C.? <laughs> Don't you think we need to have mental competency tests for anyone over the age of 75? No, when I say that, I'm not being disrespectful. We all know people who can run circles around us that are over 75. I mean, Senator Grassley is a perfect example of that. But then you have Joe Biden. These are people making decisions on our national security. These are people making decisions on the future of our economy. We need to know they're at the top of their game. There's too much at risk. So that's a lot of bad, right? It's hard to find anything good. But now I'm going to tell you what I told South Carolinians when I became governor. No more whining. No more complaining. Now we get to work. How do we fix it? Let's start by clawing back to over $100 billion of unspent COVID dollars that are out there. Instead of 87,000 IRS agents going after middle America, let's go after the hundreds of billions of dollars of COVID fraud. One out of every $7 was spent fraudulently. If 8% of our budget is interest, quit borrowing. Cut up the credit cards. You have to balance a budget every day. I had to balance a budget as governor. Why is Congress the only group that refuses to balance a budget? They have one job, and that's to pay for government and get us a budget on time. Do you know Congress has only gotten us a budget on time four times in 40 years? Four times. I think it's finally time we say, you don't get us a, a budget on time, you don't get paid.
We'll stop the spending. We'll stop the borrowing. We'll eliminate the earmarks. And I will veto any spending bill that doesn't take us back to pre-COVID levels. That will save us trillions. Then we're going to turn around and take as many federal programs as we can and send them down to the states. That way we reduce the size of the federal government and we empower people on the ground. We'd much rather have people on the ground dealing with that than having some federal bureaucrats in D.C. And do you know right now 70 percent of federal employees are still working from home three years after COVID? Do you know 75 percent of most of our agencies are sitting empty? We're paying for that. We'll start to focus on the things that really make a difference. And we have to open up the middle class. We're watching in America the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. And the middle class is getting squeezed. That's why we're going to eliminate the federal gas and diesel tax in this country. That's why we're going to cut taxes on the middle class and simplify the brackets. And we're, bless you, and we're going to make the small business tax cuts permanent. Right now, corporate tax cuts are, temp are permanent and small business ca tax cuts are temporary. Let's make them permanent. They truly are the heartbeat of our economy. Let's start taking care of them so that we can grow that economy. And then when it comes to education, we knew in South Carolina if a child couldn't read by third grade, they were four times less likely to graduate high school. So instead of pushing them forward, we started holding them back. We brought their parents in. We did reading remediation programs, and we set them up for success. We've got to do that all over this country. We've got to get our kids reading again. Then no parent should ever wonder what's being said or taught to their child in the classroom. We need complete transparency in the classroom. And every parent, our focus is to make sure we get our kids right. That's why every parent should be able to decide which school or which method of education their child gets. Every child deserves a good education, regardless of where they're born and raised. Let's stop mandating their education based on a zip code. And then let's build things in America again. Let's put vocational classes back into our high schools. We had apprenticeships all over South Carolina. We taught our kids how to build the things that we were making. That way we got them invested in our economy before they even left school. And when it comes to the border, we'll do what I did in South Carolina and we'll take it national. We will do a national E-Verify program that requires businesses to prove that the people they hire are in this country legally. We will defund sanctuary cities once and for all and get rid of the safe havens that we have in this country. We'll put 25,000 Border Patrol and ICE agents on the ground and let them do their job. We will go back to the Remain in Mexico policy so that no one even steps foot on U.S. soil. They have to process for Mexico. And instead of catch and release, we'll go to catch and deport. That's how we'll stop what's happening on the border. And when it comes to our veterans, we've all seen the images when our veterans, our men and women, deploy and the tears that are shed. And then we see the images when, God willing, they come back home to us safely and the prayers that are answered. I'm the wife of a combat veteran. My husband deployed to Afghanistan. When he returned home to us safely, that was a lot of prayers answered. But that was the easy part. The hard part's when we got home. Michael couldn't hear loud noises. He couldn't be in crowds. Life had passed him by for the year that he was gone, and the transition was tough. We can't just love our men and women when they're gone. we got to love them when they come back home, too. Let's focus on that transition. You've got to do more than just the two weeks of transition. Let's take care of them for the rest of their life. Let's do telehealth so that they get the mental health care they need right when they need it. Let's let them go to the doctor or hospital of their choice. They've earned that right. And, Marionette, I think the best way that we take care of our veterans' health care is I think every member of Congress should have to get their health care from, from the VA, and you watch how fast that gets fixed.
It'll be the best health care you've ever seen. Guaranteed. I promise you. And then there were two things when I was at the United Nations that Russia, China, and Iran never wanted us to have. They never wanted us to have a strong military, and they never wanted us to be energy independent. We won't be energy independent. We'll be energy dominant. Let's turn our energy sector into the economic powerhouse we know it can be. Let's get the EPA out of the way. Right now, they care more about sagebrush lizards than they do about whether we can afford our utility bill. Let's open it up, all of the above approach when it comes to that, including biofuels. Let's make sure we speed up permitting. Let's make sure we get the Keystone Pipeline going. Let's export as much liquefied natural gas as we can. Let's support the renewable fuel standard. And let's continue to make sure we partner with our energy producers, not demonize them. That helps us with our national security. No more going hat in hand to Saudi Arabia. No more getting dirty oil from Iran or Venezuela. So those are our domestic policy issues. Now let's talk about national security. The world is on fire, literally. You've got a war in Europe. You've got a war in the Middle East. You've got North Korea just tested an intercontinental ballistic missile that can reach the U.S. You've got China on the march. But make no mistake, none of that would have happened had we not had that debacle in Afghanistan. The idea that my husband and his military brothers and sisters who served there had to watch us leave Bagram Air Force Base in the middle of the night without telling our allies who stood shoulder to shoulder with us for decades because we asked them to be there. Think about what that told our friends. More importantly, think about what that showed our enemies. And now, what are you hearing coming out of D.C.? Do we support Ukraine or do we support Israel? Do we support Israel or do we secure the border? Don't let them lie to you like that. That is a false premise. Let's take it one at a time. Let's start with Ukraine. You should know when I was at the United Nations, Ukraine was a very good friend to us. They voted with us on almost everything. They supported everything that we did, whether I asked them to or not. Here you have this pro-American, freedom-loving country that was invaded by a thug. Half a million people have died because of Putin. I will be the first one to say, and as president, we will do this. I don't think we should ever send cash to any country because you can't follow it. You don't know how they're spending it. We don't need to put troops on the ground in Ukraine. They don't want our troops. They want to finish this themselves. But we should give them the equipment and the ammunition to win. So if you... If you are one of those people who say, well, why should we care about Ukraine? That's a legitimate question. You should want to know why is it that we're trying to go and help Ukraine. The reason we want to help Ukraine is because I saw at the United Nations, terrorists, dictators, and thugs always tell you what they're going to do. They're amazingly transparent. Hamas said they were going to break into Israel. China said they were going to take Hong Kong. Both of those happened. Russia said they were going to invade Ukraine. We watched it. China says Taiwan is next. We better believe them. Russia said once they take Ukraine, Poland and the Baltics are next. Those are NATO countries. That puts America at war. This is about preventing war. I know my opponents say that I'm a warmonger. I'm not a warmonger. My husband's in the military. The last thing I want him to do is fight in a war. This is about preventing war so that we don't send any of our men and women or more money to go fight in a war.
Now, everybody wants to know, but how does this end? And we should always want to end wars when we see the possibility. Well, if Russia left today, the war would be over. If Ukraine stopped fighting, they'd lose their country. We now know Russia has hit rock bottom. They lost 87% of their military forces that started the war. They've raised the draft age in Russia to 65. They're getting drones from Iran and missiles from North Korea. Putin knows he's in trouble. If we support Ukraine, it's only 3.5% of our defense budget. That's it. Europeans are paying more than that, and they should. It's their neighborhood. Now let's go to Israel. I'm haunted by what happened on October 7th. And the reason I'm haunted is because five years ago, I gave a speech to the entire world at the UN and told them that we knew there were maps. And these maps were held by Hamas. And it showed that if they could break that barrier, it was how they were going to kill as many Jews as fast as they could. And it happened. Now, for anyone that says, why should we help Israel? God help us if we don't. Israel's a bright spot in a tough neighborhood. They are the tip of the spear when it comes to defeating terrorism. It has never been that Israel needs America. It has always been that America needs Israel. And on October 7th, when we saw those people beheaded, those babies burned alive, those girls at that concert who were raped, and their naked bodies dragged through the streets of Gaza, what did they say? Death to Israel, death to America. That's why you care about that. Others, the other opponents say this is Israel's issue, it's not ours. This should be personal to us. 33 Americans were butchered on that day. They have American hostages now as we speak. Remember when I said Putin hit rock bottom? Now I'm going to show you the connection. When those horrific acts happened on October 7th, October 7th is Putin's birthday. Who's the happiest person in the world right now? It's Putin. Why? Because America and the West was looking at Ukraine. And what did we do? We moved to Israel. Now we know Russian intelligence helped Iran get Hamas through that barrier. If we support Ukraine and we support Israel, that's only 5% of our defense budget. Now, the other option they're saying is secure the border. That's job number one. National security is everything. They should secure the border. No ifs, ands, or buts. Right now, America's acting like it's September 10th. We better remember what September 12th felt like, because it only takes one to cause a tragedy. Now, if we were to support Ukraine and Israel and secure the border, that's less than 20% of Biden's green subsidies. So don't let them tell you we have to pick. You know what we pick? We pick national security. The job of Congress and the job of a president is to keep Americans safe. This is about national security. Now let's talk about the number one national security threat, China. China has been preparing for war with us for years, and that's not exaggerating. They're already here. They've already infiltrated our country. They bought 400,000 acres of U.S. soil, most recently near Grand Forks Air Force Base, where our most sensitive drone technology is. They put millions of dollars into our universities, spreading Chinese propaganda, stealing our research. Everybody got upset when the Chinese spy balloon went overhead, right? as we should. What about the fact that 90% of our law enforcement drones are Chinese? Think about the many surveillance that's happening. They've got Chinese police stations throughout our country. They've got a Chinese spy base that they're putting off our shores of 
in Cuba? We can never let Chinese military get there? There's technology that China uses to build up their military and threaten America. The Biden administration approved 70% of those requests last year. The Trump administration approved more than that. More people have died from fentanyl than the Iraq, Afghanistan, and Vietnam wars combined. 75,000 Americans last year alone. And China's building up their military at a scary pace. They now have 500 nuclear warheads. That's 100 more than they had last year. They've got the largest naval fleet in the world. They have 370 ships. They'll have 400 ships in two years. We won't even have 350 ships in two decades. They're doing artificial intelligence. They're doing space. They're doing cyber. They're developing hypersonic missiles. We've barely gotten started. And now China's the lead developer of neurostrike weapons, weapons engineered to change the brain activity of military commanders and segments of the population. That's who we're dealing with. So don't let Biden and Yellen tell you that China's a competitor. I dealt with China every day at the United Nations. They never saw us as a competitor. They always saw us as an enemy. We got to start looking at them the way they look at us. You see how it affected Iowa. They bought the largest pork producer in the country right here in Iowa. So how do we deal with China? The first thing we do is we stop selling them any U.S. soil and we take back the land they already purchased. We go to our universities and we say, you either take foreign money or you take American money. But the days of taking both are over. We get the intrusion out of our universities. We close, we close down every one of those Chinese police stations in our country. We blacklist all of that technology that they're using to threaten America. And we go to China and we say, we're going to end all normal trade relations with you until you stop murdering Americans. You watch how fast they move. They need our economy. And then we focus on building up our military. Strong militaries don't start wars. Strong militaries prevent wars. And that doesn't mean throwing a lot of money at the Department of Defense. It actually means getting them mission-focused again, pulling down regulations, pulling down red tape, having them stop play favorites with defense contractors, making sure that we get rid of all the programs that aren't focused on building a strong military. For goodness sake, we have got to stop with these gender pronoun classes that they're teaching our military. It is demoralizing to them. And then let's focus on the threats of the future. We've got too many generals looking at wars of the past. Yes, there were land, air, and sea, but we need to modernize and be ready for artificial intelligence and cyber and space and hypersonic missiles and submarines. That's when we'll get our focus back. And look, I was very dependent on China for trade. Let's not wait for them to pull the rug out from under us. Let's go ahead and be proactive. We'll get with our friends, India, Japan, South Korea, the Philippines, Australia, New Zealand, Israel. Let's start selling to them instead of China. And I'll help do that. That's what a president does. You export your goods out to the world. That what, that's what grows our economy. So we know how to get back on track with national security. But in order to do any of this, we have to end the national self-loathing that's taken over this country. The idea that they say America's bad or rotten or racist. I was elected the first female minority governor in history. America's not racist, we're blessed. Our kids need to know to love America. They need to be saying the Pledge of Allegiance when they start school every day. You know, five months ago, I dropped my husband, Michael, off at 4 a.m. for another year-long deployment. And I watched him and 230 soldiers 
pick up their two duffel bags of belongings to go to a country they'd never been, all in the name of protecting America. They're willing to sacrifice their lives and their families because they still believe in this amazing experiment that is America. So if they're willing to sacrifice for us there, shouldn't we be willing to fight for America here? Because we have a country to save. But in order to do that, we've got to acknowledge some hard truths. Republicans have lost the last seven out of eight popular votes for president. That's nothing to be proud of. We should want to win the majority of Americans. But the only way to do that is if we have a new generational leader that leaves the negativity and the baggage behind. Another hard truth. I think President Trump was the right president at the right time. I had a good working relationship with him. I agreed with a lot of his policies. But rightly or wrongly, chaos follows him. You know I'm right. Chaos follows him. And we can't be a country in disarray and a world on fire and go through four more years of chaos. We won't survive it. And don't ever forget, a vote for Joe Biden is a vote for Kamala Harris. And we, I cannot truly understand how we will survive a President Kamala Harris. And you look at these general election head-to-head matchups. Head-to-head, Trump and Biden are even. On a good day, he might be up by two. Wall Street Journal had him up by four. That's margin of error. DeSantis doesn't beat Biden. I'm in every one of those general election polls. And I defeat Biden by double digits. Wall Street Journal, I defeated him by 17 points. Do you know what a win of 17 points does? That makes it more than the presidency. That's governorships. That's House. That's Senate. Those are wins. That, going into D.C. with a win like that, that's a mandate. It's a mandate for us to pay down our debt and get our economy back on track. That's a mandate to get our kids reading again and get our schools back to the basics. That's a mandate to secure our border, no excuses. That's a mandate to have law and order back into our country, and that's a mandate for a strong America that we can be proud of. That's what we want. That's our goal. Do you remember when you were growing up how safe life felt, how simple it was? It was about faith, family, and country. Our parents raised us to be responsible individuals. We went to school, and we learned what we needed to to be successful. Bless you. We went to church, and we found our faith and our conscience. Don't you want that again? Because we could have that again. But in order to have it, it's going to take a lot of courage. Courage from everybody in this room. Courage for me to run. And courage for every one of you to know, don't complain about what happens in a general election if you don't play in this caucus. It matters. Someone asked me when I announced why I was running. I said, my parents came here 50 years ago to an America that was strong and proud and full of opportunities. I want them to know that country again. I'm doing this for my husband, Michael, and his military brothers and sisters. They need to know their sacrifice matters. They need to know that we love our country. I'm doing this for my daughter who just got married. And I saw how hard it was for her and her husband to buy a home. The average homeowner in America is 49 years old. The American dream is getting further apart. And I'm doing this for my son, who's a senior in college. And I am tired of watching him have to write papers of things he doesn't believe in just to get an A. That is not us. That is not America. And for the first time, 81% of Americans 
don't think their kids are going to live as good of a life as we did. We can't be okay with that. I'm not okay with that. We do have a country to save. But I'll promise you this. If you will join with me in this fight, if you will caucus, I promise you our best days are yet to come. Thank you very much. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Y'all sure do know how to make a Southern girl feel good. I appreciate that. We are going to now turn the mics on you and open it up for questions, but I do want to say this. This press pool has been with me for months. They follow us around everywhere. God bless them because they've had to hear me over and over again. But they could tell you in all of these town halls, you don't hear me talk about any of my opponents because I want to talk to you about solutions and I want to talk to you about where we're going. But I've seen the commercials that you're seeing. And we are 26 days to caucus. And now I'm going to speak up. Every single commercial that Ron DeSantis has put up there has been a lie. And you don't have to take my word for it. Everyone from Newsmax to CNN has called his ads false. That's why he keeps taking them down, because we call him out on it, and then he ends up having to pull it down. There's not one bit of truth. Now Trump's hitting me. Even though he said a few days ago I wasn't surging, but yet he's got now attack ads going up against me. His ad says one of the same lies that Ron's ad said. They said I raised the gas tax. I never raised the gas tax. Americans for Tax Reform came out and said I never increased taxes on our people, and nor would I. We don't ever want to go that route. We want to go the other way and cut taxes. But the gas tax that they're talking about, they said I wanted to raise the gas tax. And let me tell you the story behind that. The companies in South Carolina, the Chamber of Commerce, the Truckers Association, desperately wanted to raise the gas tax for infrastructure. And for years I said, no, we're not going to do it. We're not going to do it. If we have to pay for it, we'll get it out of our coffers. We don't do that. And finally, they had such a, they were all up in arms saying we have to do it. And I said, fine, you want to raise the gas tax? We'll raise the gas tax, but that means you have to reduce the income tax by five times that amount. They didn't want to do it. But mine was always making sure we cut taxes, never raise taxes. So if these fellas are going to lie about me, I'm going to tell the truth about them. Ron DeSantis authored and led the charge to ban the renewable fuel standard. Look it up. He banned offshore drilling. He banned fracking. The Sierra Club loves him. It's all on record. And then he goes and brings someone to campaign in Iowa who's the most anti-Israel Republican we have. They bring a guy, Ron brings a guy, that voted with the squad against condemning anti-Semitism on college campuses. Voted with the squad against condemning those college presidents that said those ridiculous things in Congress. This is the same guy that voted against us pulling back the $6 billion that was going to Iran for five hostages. That's who he brings to campaign with him in Iowa? And then Trump goes and says, I raised taxes. But instead, 2018, he proposed raising the gas tax by 25 cents. Donald Trump did that. Everybody talks about what a good economy we had with him. And we did, right? But you know what? 
He put us $8 trillion in debt to do that. And our kids are never going to forgive us for it. So this is silly season. You're going to see a lot of stuff out there. If there's anything, ask me. I will tell you. But right now I'll say this. If candidates have to lie to win, they don't deserve to win. Okay, so we will now open it up for questions. There are two guys with microphones. If you raise your hand, there's nothing I won't answer. You may not like my answer, but there's nothing I won't answer. Yes, sir. Have you watched how Mayorkas treats the Oversight Committee in his hearings? It's despicable. The first thing that I would, yes, I've seen it, and it is despicable, and it's a big problem we have in government. You will see me when I become president. The first thing I will do is exactly what I did when I became governor. I said, let's control what we can control first. I replaced the head of every agency, whether they were doing good or not, because we needed to freshen it up. I focused on the mission because they needed to stop doing all the things that were not mission focused for that agency. I put people at the heads of those agencies, some who didn't vote for me, but they knew their constituency. So in the ag agency, we put a, someone who knew agribusiness, that knew the challenges and the successes that farmers could have. In tourism, I put someone who knew heads and beds and people on golf courses. It was always knowing the constituency. Veterans Affairs, we put a veteran that knew what veterans went through and how to cut through it. So we'll replace the head of every agency. The second thing I did, and I'll do the same, we sent people into every agency to clean it up. Pull down old regs, pull down um, old laws, get rid of problem children. There's a lot of that in bureaucracy. And in some cases, we tweaked agencies. In other cases, we gutted agencies. And then I started giving them 90-day benchmarks. They had to start showing us their results every 90 days for the taxpayers to see so that the taxpayers could see a return on investment. And then we knew that they were spending money because they were worried they wouldn't get the same amount the next year. So I put all the spending online for everyone to see. And then we incentivized our agencies to start giving money back to the taxpayers. And magic happened because they started to compete on who could be the most effective and efficient. And then once we did that, I went to my legislature, I will go to Congress, and we gave them a couple of easy things to pass so they could remember what it was like to win again. And then we started giving them harder and harder things. We have to get to where government remembers it serves the people. The people don't want to work for government anymore. If, a, if any agency is costing a person or a business time, that should be unacceptable. And we have to make sure we take the politics out of these agencies We've got to make sure we get all of these power fiefdoms out of agencies, and we've got to start getting them back on track. And that's what I'll do. It's actually the very first thing you do when you become the head of something is you clean out all the noise and all the things that are slowing government down, and you start getting it back on track, and that's what we'll do. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Hi. Um, you did not mention that you're on the board of directors from Boeing. And Boeing makes money off of warfare, and you're urging warfare wherever it's possible. And uh, I'd like to know why you told Netanyahu to finish, finish them, referring to the Gazans, like clear them all out. Uh, that is urging genocide. That lowers our standard in the world. All these weapons used against Gaza are made here in the USA. And if we stop the weapons, flowing in. That would stop the genocide. Thank you for that question. <clears throat> I am not on the board of Boeing. I worked with Boeing to get them to build planes in South Carolina. 8,000 jobs. Fantastic win for our state. Boeing is a good company. They build planes for our Air Force. They build planes, commercial planes. When I finished my stint at the United Nations, 
they asked me to serve on the board of Boeing, and I did. I served for 10 months, and the reason that I left Boeing's board is because I don't believe in corporate subsidies. I don't think government should be going and doing, I don't believe in corporate bailouts. And so what happened was COVID hit, and Boeing wanted to go to government to get a bailout, and I don't believe in that. And so I respectfully said, I need to leave this board because it went against everything I believed in. I still love that company. I still think they do a great service for America. But the right thing to do is when it doesn't agree, when, when a company does something that you're working on and you don't agree with their values, you have to respectfully walk away. And that's what I did. So that's the issue of Boeing. Every bit of that about that is a lie. I don't have a, I don't work for a defense contractor. I've never worked for a defense contractor. And then when it comes to the fact that you talk about Gazans, I made my case on why we need to take care of Israel. We should do three things with Israel. We should give them whatever they need whenever they need it. We should make sure we eliminate Hamas, finish them, because if we just weaken them, they will do this again, and they'll do it to America. And then we should do whatever it takes to get our hostages home. I stand by that. I believe in that. And I know that if you let the terrorists go into Israel, the terrorists are going to come here, and that's what we can't have happen. Yes. First off, thank you so much for coming to Burlington. Uh, my question is regarding cannabis. Uh, what would you do as president when it comes to uh, legalization of cannabis? Because I guess in my personal view, I do think alcohol is worse than cannabis when you see DUIs, uh, domestic assault, etc. And I personally used it in states that were legal as well as countries that were illegal. I do truly believe with balance and proper responsibility, it can be used well. And don't you think if it was legalized and there was taxes imposed, we can use those taxes for drug addiction recovery programs instead of using law enforcement to prosecute those and even take power away from the cartels, as our congresswoman had talked about? Thank you. I do think, I mean, look, addiction centers is something that is a huge, we have to start addressing that and mental health, and that has to be a priority as we go forward. When it comes to cannabis, I think it's fine for every state to decide. Those types of decisions are best decided by the people of the state. Some states will want it. That's fine. Some states won't. But I think when it's closest to the people, when you do decisions like that, you have to let the people decide. And I think we've got some states that have legalized it, and then we've got some states who said they don't want to legalize it. But I think it's best when it's close to the people. Yes. Hey, Nikki. Hi. Um, I met you, I heard you speak at the Iowa State Fair, and since then I've just been kind of keeping track of um, all the reports that you've done. But since then I've also been keeping track of the election. I've also noticed that the younger generation, like the kids in my grade, are not paying attention at all. And it's scary because the election is next year, and we don't know what we're going to be voting for. So in order to keep the younger generation engaged, how are you planning to do so? Such a great question because – you know what's important for everybody here to know? The younger generation, they're really smart. And they really are going to be the group that saves us. I believe that. But they think differently than the way we were raised. They don't care as much about money. They care a lot about making a difference, being a part of something bigger than themselves. They don't watch TV to get the news because they think both sides are crazy, and I don't think they're wrong. <laughs> they get most of their news from the Internet. They care about the environment, but guess what? So do we. We all want clean air. We all want clean water. It's how we get to it that we need to focus in on. We need to get them invested in. And right now, if you talk to any of the younger generation, they are tired of the noise. They're worried about their future. 
They don't see where they're going to get a job. They don't see that they can afford a home. They don't know what the American dream is. They've been through COVID, and they watched government get heavy-handed, and they lost a lot of time. We're seeing a lot more anxiety, stress, and depression from all of that. And so what I will tell you is I'm going to continue to pull you all in because we need you. We need you to be a part of the solution. And we owe it to you to make sure we show you what that American dream can look like again. And so we're going to talk to you about things like the environment because we want that too. But we're going to say the way we deal with the environment is we go after China and, and India to make them do their part. We're going to talk to you about college and college loans because a lot of them have that. And the way you deal with college loans is how is it that we can turn around and fill out a ton of paperwork to buy a house or buy a car. But when a student goes to get a student loan, you don't tell them anything about what it means to pay it back, what percentage they're going to have to pay it back, what that does to their credit score, none of it. We owe it to them to help them know how to make good decisions. We owe it to them to hear their voice on what they want going forward. And so what I'll tell you is get your friends involved. Tell them to go to NikkiHaley.com and watch a town hall. And tell them to be part of the solution. Because we'll do this together. We know how to get America back on track. But we can't do it without you. We've got to have you in the fold. And if we do that, we're going to make a lot of people proud together. I promise you that. Yes. Hi. Um, I honestly came here not knowing much about you, Nikki, but my son brought me, so I'm very Yay for your son. Yeah. I'm very excited um, to hear what you have to say, and your comments about education are what I want to refer to. Um, I'm a mom of five. The first three were homeschooled. The second two have gone to community school here, and I'm... I appreciate school, but I also look at it as a service to us as Americans. And so what you said about reforming I think needs to happen. I also now have an oldest daughter who teaches at a local school, and they don't make enough money. And that's a big deal, to, I think, about. And, of course, we're in a crisis. There's not enough teachers. There's all kinds of things going on. So what do we do to pay teachers what they're worth and then to get – curriculum in there that serves a wide, you know, population and still does what it needs to do. Well, thank you for taking the time to come. You know, um, when, you, when you look at the situation with education, my son-in-law, it's a fifth grade elementary school teacher, so I know exactly what you're talking about. Right now, the pressure on teachers is off the charts because they now have to be the parent and the guidance counselor and the nurse and the pastor. And, oh, by the way, they have to teach to a test, and they don't get paid enough. And all these teachers want is to do what they went to school to do. They just want to teach these kids. They don't want to have all this extra stuff to have to deal with. And so, yes, we need to go back to pay as one thing, but let teachers do what teachers truly want to do which is to help grow children, not have all this other stuff around them. The second thing is what I saw when we were reforming education in South Carolina. We did the reading initiative, but I, always, I also went and looked at how we could change the funding formula because I wanted to lift up the rural challenged areas in South Carolina without bringing down the good areas. And what I saw is the Department of Education – goes to every state and says, if you teach this, you'll get this much money, this much money. If you teach this, you'll get this much money. If you teach critical race theory, you get this much money. And so what happened is states started teaching to the money instead of teaching to the kids. And now you don't have it. It's not about science and math and history and reading and arts anymore. It's about all these other things that are not supposed to be there. And look at the damage of what they're doing to our kids. You know, when you hear critical race theory, most people hear it, they know it's not a good thing, but they don't know what it means. Let me give you an example of what critical race theory does. When a school has critical race theory, and there are still so many that do this, 
one thing that they do. They stand every student in the back of the classroom. And they say, if you have two parents at home, step forward. If you have a two-car garage, step forward. If your family goes on vacation once a year, step forward. If your parents were, went to college, step forward. And it goes through all these things. And so what happens? The, student at the, the students at the front feel guilty for their family's success. But think about the students in the back. What have you just done to them? Because you made them feel like nothing when we want them to know they can do everything. That's not growing a child. That's dividing our country. And that's dangerous because our job is to build confidence in kids. And you can't build confidence if you're promoting one group to feel guilty and you're making the others feel like they'll never be anything. So we've got to get back to the basics. And that's why I said, when I said we want to move federal programs down to the states, education programs, just imagine if you move them from the Department of Education down to the state. You know, I talked about vocational classes. Vocational classes in Iowa would be very different than the vocational classes in South Carolina. But you could also have, then it would be back in the hands of the state and the school boards and the parents on what you actually teach and have more money to teach it with so that we can pay teachers more. This isn't rocket science. It's just a matter of you can't have everything running out of D.C. because it's proven that all it's done is left us with 31% of eighth graders in this country who are proficient in reading. Yes. Hi. Your husband for service. Thank you. I have a son that serves, and he's a special operator. He's deployed in some of the worst places. So God I, bless him. I know what, what it's like. Uh, I work for the local college uh, on the continuing education side. I work for the uh, with a lot of businesses and industries. Um, there isn't a one of them that tells me they can't get people, right? Um, so I dig into a lot of statistics, and one of the things that shocked me was how low our labor participation rate is, particularly for young men. Uh, used to be in the high 90s. Uh, those young men, 18 to 35, it's in the high 80s now. Um, how do we get them back working? I guess, how do, we, how do we get Americans back working? I mean, the unemployment rate is low, but that really means nothing when you've got 10% of people sitting on the sidelines. No, it's right. Well, first of all, thank you for your son. God bless your family for the sacrifice. Um, you know... Presidents typically meet with governors once a year. I will meet with governors once a quarter, Republican and Democrat, with the sole focus of how do we show states what they can do to lift everybody up. Let me give you an example. When I was governor in South Carolina, and I told you we had thousands of people on welfare, I took those that were on welfare who would be sitting on the couch, and I matched them up with businesses. And I told my businesses, if you will take this person and train them, I will pay for them for X number of weeks. And at the end, you decide if you want to hire them. We moved 35,000 people from welfare to work. And we broke, in a lot of cases, it was a generational cycle. They had done it because their parents had done it and everybody else. And we would have family celebrations because their kids could see what their parents accomplished. But they also learned what it meant to be productive members of society. A lot of times they don't know where to get the training. So if you match them up, that's how you can get them back to work. That's what we'll show every state how to do. We also went into our prison systems. I wanted to know how people got in, what happened to them when they were there, and what happened when they left. And I visited men's, women's prisons, maximum security, all kinds. And we reformed our prison system. We taught the inmates computer skills. We taught them how to build a resume. We taught them financial planning, family planning. We gave them faith-based help if they needed it. But I put equipment behind the fence, and we taught them a skill. Now in South Carolina, when someone leaves the fence, they've got a job to go to the next day. South Carolina has the lowest recidivism rate in the country. When we focus on lifting up the least of these, when we focus on getting people to be productive again, that's when magic happens.
because your economy grows, families get stronger, people feel more patriotic, and things start to move. We have to do that again. And so I will work with every state so that they know that we've got it. It's harder, but you got to do that extra work to get people used to working again. We've got to get them back out there, but we have to help them. Sometimes they don't know how to get back out, but we show them how, and then that's how we'll get some more success stories along the way. This will be the last question. I'll make it a great one. Once you're elected and have gained control of the border, what are your plans for the millions of illegal immigrants that are already in the country? This will sound cold, but you got to send them back. And the reason is you have to... If you don't send them back, there's two things. One, you've had people who've stood in line legally, put in the time, put in the price, like my parents. My husband and I take care of my parents. They live with us. They're 87 and 89. There is not a time I sit down with my mom for dinner where she doesn't say, are those people still crossing the border? They are offended by what's happening here. Most legal immigrants are offended by what's happening on the border because they did it the right way. And so the last thing you can do is incentivize people to turn around and keep coming. So you have to deport them. They have to go back to the back of the line. And we have to make sure that we are make that all of their families see it. Because when you had those half a million Venezuelans that Biden gave temporary status to, half a million social security numbers, half a million driver's licenses, I saw at the United Nations what happens. They get on the phone and they call their family and more come. We have to show there's a price to pay. We have to show them it's not worth the trek to make it over here because they're not going to be let in. And the best way to show them that is you've got to deport the people that came here illegally. So I will leave you with this. Thank you for taking the time to spend your morning with me. You know, when I told you I ran against that longest-serving legislator in the primary, People laughed at me, and I got to work, and I earned their support, and we won. When I ran for governor, I was the Tea Party candidate. I ran against a lieutenant governor, an attorney general, a very popular congressman, and a state senator. I was Nikki Who. I had 3% in the polls. I had the least amount of money. But I worked South Carolina like no one else, and we won. When I got to the United Nations, they said I didn't have enough experience, and we took the kick me sign off of our backs. I have been underestimated in everything I've ever done, and it's a blessing because it makes me scrappy. No one will outwork me in this race. No one will outsmart me in this race because we have a country to save. So if you like what I had to say today, there are some cards on your table. Go tell 10 people. Tell your friends. Tell your family. Get out and caucus for us. On those cards, you can check whether you want to volunteer. You can check if you want to caucus. If you have a question I didn't answer, you can ask the question, and we'll make sure you get an answer. But be a part of what we could do. Go tell 10 people. If you don't like what I had to say today, Shh. <laughs> Just don't say anything and don't tell anyone you are here. God bless you.